Hey folks, it's Ray with Taste Radio. Right now, I'm honored to be sitting down with Porvi Patodia, who is the founder and CEO of Vienna. Porvi, great to see you. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming back to our office. Yeah. You're here at least once a year. Right, right. Yeah, we hold events uh, for... Well, the community to come in and see us, and then we also hold events in conjunction with Naturally New England. Uh, you were a judge for the most recent New England Pitch Slam, which was yeah, awesome. Yeah, that was a great event. Yeah, it was. Uh, and thank you so much again for being a judge. We, uh, I, I felt like when I was watching that, you were the the alpha judge, if I don't mind me, I, if you don't really? mind me saying. Yes, I think <laughs> because you're... you're but you've been doing well, this for 12 I'm, years. I'm you brand, know what's going on. I, yeah, I'm a brand owner, right? Yeah. So I think I was the brand representative, right? Yeah. And so, of course, you know, just the role itself, uh, you know, so. Well, it's it's interesting. I, and I don't mean to throw shade at anybody else. But if you haven't built a business, if you're not an entrepreneur, it's really hard, I think, for you to give the best mm. advice you can kind of give. I think there's some really good advice you can share. I think there's advice that you can share based on others experience and just in evaluation of what makes a great brand and what makes a business successful but unless you've you know had those sleepless nights and you know questioned everything <laughs> like yeah. Forby's nodding your head like yes yep. daily yeah. <laughs> daily <laughs> it's really hard I think to put yourself in that position of being able to share advice and give good insights uh, yeah, I, I could I can see that, um, you know, increasingly I've been, um, you know, mentoring founders or, you know, do, having different conversations with with different emerging brand founders who are, you know, navigating different challenges or thinking through questions. And um, yeah, there's just you're right in the sense that, you know, there's a lot of experience that I can I can call upon. And I've also, I think, had the benefit of um having led a brand for a decade now, right? And so I've actually seen the impact of decisions that I've made um, or strategies that my team has taken. And I know like what's worked well, what's not worked well. Um, and so just having that experience, I think uh, people find to be helpful, so. For sure. One of the greatest things that an entrepreneur can see is their product organically incorporated into a TV show. Yeah, uh, this happened recently with Vienna, uh, where there was a there is a TV show called Nobody Wants This, featuring the famous actress Kristen Bell. And I guess when she was working out, or while she was working out, she was snacking on your veggie chips. Is this what I'm seeing? I'm, I'm watching it on Instagram. I can't tell if she's working out or not. She's doing this kind of weird yeah, dance. Yeah, yeah. I think she's she uh, was is pacing more or less pacing, <laughs> deciding if she wants to like open this box full of secrets that her boyfriend has in, in a cabinet or something. Oh, so okay. yeah, yeah. So that's I think that's what the scene is. Yeah. And while snacking on your chips. Yeah, while she was snacking on our veggie chips, and that was um, uh, a huge surprise. So um, you know, I started getting texts. I think, and it's I guess it's an it's in uh, episode eight. So it's like, how many people, as soon as the show was released, got to episode eight <laughs> that quickly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I suddenly started getting, you know, texts and DMs and my team as well. Uh, so that was that was really fun. Yeah, yeah. I think um, our managing editor for Nosh, Monica Watrous, saw it and she, she posted it on her gram. Um, yeah, it, it, did, you didn't send them. You didn't. Did you send them no. any, any chips or anything? No, no? we okay. didn't. No, we wow. didn't. We do get you know uh, studios reaching out, movie studios reaching out for um, sponsorship deals or product placement. So sometimes you know we'll send snacks, um, you know, for to be helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, and why not, right? And so, yeah. but yeah, we did not have. We did not place that there. Do you have any time to watch TV and eat snacks? I do have time to That's watch good. TV. Yeah, That's yeah. That's good. Okay. <laughs> you have to have some of that time in your life, right? So, yeah. yeah. What's uh, What's your favorite TV show at this point? Uh, and if you don't have any, if it's just movies, that's yeah. fine. I really watch a lot of TV yeah. myself. Yeah. No, there's something I'm watching right now. What is it? Oh, I'm watching um, Industry. Okay. I've heard of it. On, I don't know much about on, it. On uh, Max or HBO Max. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, this, uh, it's this show about investment bankers in... Uh, in London, so and and that whole industry, uh, so exciting. Yeah, very different from the natural food industry. I'll say that. So, yeah, I would assume it is. I would assume yeah. they're more interested in 
robbing you guys <laughs> than they are similar otherwise. pressures but different different types of pressure i would say yeah, yeah. i would think so um anything else that uh, you do to kind of keep yourself even keeled as a as a founder i mean i think the biggest thing is you know having a family mm. right and uh and so you know i uh the whole time that i've been running Vienna, i've been a mom right and and a wife and so um having kids forces moments and times and hours in your day where you've got to put down what you do and um you know you want to spend time with them right and so um i think that's a really really good thing so people who listen to a previous episode that i did with peter ray hall mm -hmm. who's the founder of rx bar and most recently of david um were are probably going to be a little upset that he answered a question that the way that he did but he did offer caveat and the answer to the question was yes the question was does hard work mean working all the time mm -hmm. and he said yes but he did offer the caveat of you know if i had a family or if i had personal commitments um it would be a little bit different mm -hmm. he has I, I believe he has a a new son he has a mm -hmm. young son and he's about to get married so um, i wonder if that's going to change a little bit for him but there are other people who will say you know this is what you said having a family keeps you grounded gives you a reason to move away from work mm -hmm. and a real important reason to move yeah. away from work when you need to and i think it kind of also um sometimes brings you back down to earth about what's really important yeah yeah i mean i you know i am also like i i work a lot of hours there's just no other way to say it i work a lot of hours and so just for context how many hours a week do you say you work i really don't know but um i don't know let's say 60 hours right okay. so um and so yeah it's a challenge managing that kind of workload you know when you're also raising a family but um i think uh like family is a great reason to stop working because if I didn't have a family, I would just literally work 24 seven because I love what I do and I'm mm -hmm. like super engrossed in it. Right. And so, um, and then I think the other reason, uh, if you want to talk about building a consumer business, it's amazing to look through the world, look at the world through your children's eyes. Right. And, and, and it gives you a fresh perspective on, food and all kinds of things you know it, it help i think it helps make you a better um business leader so mm -hmm. there's a family in the business this business of better for you food that has been in the news quite a bit lately and that's the garza family mm. the garza family are behind a brand known as siete siete has been in the news because pepsico has decided to acquire the brand for 1.2 billion with a b dollars this is uh great news i think um but you know for someone like yourself who's been in the business for quite some time who runs a better for you snacking company i wonder how you evaluated the deal and how you're thinking about it in the context of vienna yeah i mean i think um i mean first of all huge congrats to you know veronica and linda and the family i got to know veronica and linda a tiny bit um a couple of years ago we, because we were all featured in a target ad campaign um and so at the the video shoot uh because we were all there i got, I got a chance to spend some time with them you know great amazing people and, and so happy for them um, I think that there are some great uh, learnings there for anyone building a brand, which is, um, and I genuinely believe that in order to really win and build an amazing business and an amazing brand long term, you need true differentiation in the market. And I think what Siete has done really well is I see, when I look at their brand, I see differentiation on two aspects, which is that on the product side, they've built differentiated products that deliver on attributes that other brands are not. And so, you know, in particular, I think their commitment to both grain free and dairy free was some of, you know, some w one of the early reasons that consumers started to embrace the brand. And mm -hmm. so having delivering on something that the consumer wants that other people are not delivering on, you know, that's what really helps you build that long term 
sustainable advantage in the market, doing doing something hard that other people are not doing, right, for the customer. And then it's kind of wrapped in this super um, friendly, you know, brand, which is all about family and food and culture. And mm-hmm. so I think a lot of people can connect with that too. And they brought that to life in some beautiful ways. And so when you combine those two things, it, you know, works really well together to both connect with the consumer on an emotional level with the brand element of it, but then also back it up with great products that are really differentiated. And so I think that that concept of those two things working together, you know, you really need that um, because I think brands try to do are good at one or the other. Um, but when you put them together, you can really create magic. If I'm hearing you correctly, I'm hearing that functionality is really important. The functional piece as well as the consumer connection mm-hmm. with kind of the consumer facing brand, right? Because if you just have the functional piece, it's a little bit more flat. Um, so where does great taste fit into all this? Because I, I, I always hear about Siete. Yeah. And it seems like taste is low on the hierarchy of importance for people strangely it always seems like oh yeah they have great branding they're grain free they're dairy free etc cetera, etc cetera. and then somehow like i know their t- their products taste good but you know where does that land yeah i mean maybe people don't talk about it just because taste in some ways feels like it's table stakes in the food industry mm-hmm. but to your point um and something that you know with bienna that we put we, we put taste first and foremost mm-hmm. Um, because I think people don't talk about it because they think it's a given that if you're going to be a food, if you're going to build a food brand, it has to taste good. And everyone says that, but do you actually deliver on that right for your consumer? And so, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't tasted, you know, all the Siete products, but, um, I've tasted a few of them and I think, I mean, the consumers are clearly embracing it. And so, you know, yeah, I'm sure I, I know that taste is a, a big driver of that, I think, for any brand in, in food. So I imagine you had a couple investors send you a note about the deal and say, hey, look at this. Mm-hmm. Very exciting. When are we going to get ours? <laughs> and, you know, certainly you're doing great. Vienna's doing great. And there's no rush to do something, you know, or, or you know, race to an exit. But I have a feeling that investors are just like licking their lips and saying, look at this, you know, look, we could do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, How much does a deal like this put pressure on you or um, influence your interest in a potential exit? Yeah, um, I would say, you know, the deal, I think, is great news for the industry. Mm -hmm. Um, For Bienna in particular, it doesn't really put incremental pressure of any kind because you know we have a very clear strategy that we're executing against which is all about building a brand that has long-term you know sustainable value Mm -hmm. and so um in terms of an exit you know it's not something i'm thinking about right now um and so because right now we're really just focused on this strategy that we have to to build out kind of the two snacking platforms that we have so yeah, you were talking about this before we hopped in the mics. Um, l- let's back up for a second and just yeah. talk about Bienna as a brand, yeah. where you are right now, um, and about this dual snacking platform concept. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, over the last five years, um, and certainly with COVID, um, obviously COVID was terrible in a lot of ways. Um, but one thing um, that it, it we kind of, use it as an opportunity um, to to really kind of reset the stage in terms of what our goals were. And it it created a, um, a time period where I think where as a CEO, I could say, you know what, this business is not about what's going to happen in the next year or two or even three years. It's really about what can we do to build a just a beautiful brand that is really here for the long term. And so you know, when I thought about, and me and our team, when we thought about like, what is, what is, why are we here? You know, what is it that we're looking to build? And when I think about a great brand, um, there were kind of three attributes that I really focus on. And so like one, it's building a mission-driven brand that has, as I said before, highly differentiated products and is solving problems for people. The second piece is great margins. And the third piece is really exciting growth opportunities. 
And those three things to me is a trifecta, right? That's the kind of business and the kind of brand that I want to be working on. Mm -hmm. And I think is what, what a lot of people want to, you know, strive towards. And so um, that's really, you know, getting all those three things together in a business, that's really exciting. And so that's what we've been working towards. And it's really amazing in the last couple of years, you know, we took a lot of actions um, to make those things happen. And, you know, here we are in 2024 and it's exciting because a lot of those and some risky decisions that we took, um, you know, have all kind of come together. And so we're here at a time where we're having, you know, our strongest year yet, you know, both in terms of revenues as well as on the, you know, and profitability. So both top line and bottom line with, with strong growth rates. And so, It's exciting when you take risks and you do hard things and, you know, when those things start to come together and you really start seeing the results of of that work. So how many doors is Biona in right now? So we're in about 15,000 stores. Yeah. When you say risky decisions that paid off. Yeah. um, First of all, what were those decisions and how did you evaluate the risk? Yeah. So, um, you know, so the context here is you know, when COVID hit, we already had a business, right? And so we had, you know, products in distribution and in, and um, and products that were doing well, um, but COVID hit. And so then all these, suddenly all these things changed, right? Certain things, certain channels, like let's say travel, sure. where we had great distribution and um, placement, you know, that went to like zero overnight. And Mm -hmm. then other channels like e-commerce and Amazon suddenly shot through the roof. And so we had to work hard um, to change our strategy to not only meet what was happening in the market, but as I said, to really think about the long term, you know. And so um, some of the risky decisions that we took included things like um, walking away from certain channels that were low margin, uh, or customers that were low margin, um, making decisions around product lines and SKUs. So specifically, for example, we decided to walk away from a protein puff product line that we had because the um, production was just not as stable as we would like and margins were kind of all over the place. So even though we saw demand for the product line, the margins were not where we wanted them to be. Um, uh, pricing decisions, right? And so, and that was one of the most crucial things that we did, um, which was we, you know, our our costs were increasing um, significantly with the cost of labor going up and, and our raw materials, freight, things like that. Um, and because we were so focused on kind of the margin piece of what, you know, what being one of the three things that I talked about in terms of building a really great business, um, you know, we had to we had to take price increases, and mm-hmm. you know, we did it probably twice, um, and that was a really risky decision because we had to cross like a five dollar barrier, for example, mm-hmm. um, and we, you know, we looked at the data. Um, you know, I am a very data oriented person, so we were looking at things like price elasticities and things like that. Um, and everything we were looking at said that our products are are on the inelastic side, meaning that you know you can increase your price and it's not going to impact your volumes dramatically to a certain point, right? So it will still Im- it can still impact your volumes, um, but not to a level that it would be um, damaging to the overall sales. When you say you have products that are on the inelastic side of things, is it? just the roasted chickpeas or is it across the board? Yeah, I mean, I think both of our product lines have some because they're premium and they're delivering on things that that the consumer can't find elsewhere. I do think that we have inelastic products in in both. Mm -hmm. Um, But certainly um, the roasted chickpeas, you know, the that kind of protein platform, we just we you know we took some of those risky decisions on around pricing and customers like distribution and things like that and as a result um what we learned is that the brand has tremendous loyalty you know and has has really um loyal consumers that are finding unique value in our products and 
they're coming back and they're buying at the same rate. And so that was a huge learning for us um, and also risky at the same time. So we also did other things like we changed manufacturing partners, um, you know, really every aspect of the business we examined and we kind of re-evaluated, um, you know, the approach and the strategy. So going back to the dual platform um, of Bienna and taking two very distinct paths to future growth, um, was this a decision that has been in the back of your mind for a long time or did this also come from the data that you've been using and sourcing um, to make decisions about innovation and new product development? Yeah, so, um, you know, we... W I've always been interested in the salty snack aisle, right? I mean, the goal here is to recreate the snack aisle um, mm -hmm. with plant-based nutrition. And so, um, you know, I've always been interested in the snack aisle, but the question was always, you know, how can we, is there a job to be done for the consumer that right. isn't being done by someone else, you know? And so is there a gap in the market that we can fill? And so, for a long time, you know, we were, I was hesitant to enter into that category if we didn't have a highly differentiated proposition. And there was some data that we saw, I think around 2021, 2022, that kind of opened our eyes up to this opportunity around low calorie snacking. Mm -hmm. And the data basically said that more than 50% of Americans are on a diet at any given time. And really? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I think it includes people that are, um, even just casually watching their weight, right? Even okay. if they're not on an official diet. So this, does this include things like, I don't know, paleo isn't considered to be a weight loss diet. Does it, but you're talking about weight loss diets specifically. No, I'm talking about all diets. Okay. All diets. Right, all yeah, right. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the number one way that they're looking at foods when they're on a diet is still by looking at calories. Mm -hmm. And obviously we all know that the quality of, the food and the quality of the calorie matters, right? Like, you know, all calories are not the same. But our learning from looking at that data and the consumer insights was that calories are still kind of a simple heuristic that consumers look at uh, when they turn to the back of the bag. And so um, when we looked at the chip aisle in particular, chips are still the number one snacking format across all of snacks. And what we were really surprised to see is that there's not a single brand within chips that's really positioned to or that's really focused on delivering that benefit for the consumer mm -hmm. and so we just thought about it like is there something that we could develop that meets our bar for you know delicious taste um, and clean ingredients but also delivers on this kind of nutritional need that the consumer has and isn't being done by someone else and um, that's where we came up with our Veggie Crisps platform and and that whole product line, which is, you know, most chips have eight to twelve chips in a serving. No one realizes that, right? There's a lot of hidden calories in snacking. You just kind of open up a bag and you just keep eating. Mm -hmm. And so we created the first low calorie chip that has, you know, thirty five chips in a serving. You don't have to, you know, stop yourself from indulging and you can just snack away and get kind of this higher level of snacking satisfaction because there's a lot more chips in any serving and it's just four calories per chip. Yeah, it's very clear on the front of pack here. It's, it says 40 ca calories per 10 crisps um, on both of your flavors. You have a dairy-free nacho and you have a Himalayan pink salt. Um, one thing that is less uh, visible than I think in previous products or as certainly in your chickpea snacks is chickpeas. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's some imagery that includes chickpeas uh, on the front of pack, but it's not like you're leading with chickpeas. Yeah, yeah. Um, clearly a conscious decision. Yeah, um, and you know, this came really out of the research we did with consumers as well in the sense that when they're thinking about, um, you know, eating a healthier snack, um, it's not as much sometimes about a specific ingredient, mm -hmm. right? It's, you know, no one's thinking like, I specifically want this this particular ingredient. It's really that you're trying to satisfy this need for like a healthier option, right? And so 
um, chickpeas are veggies. Um, and so, you know, that was a choice that we made in terms of what resonated with the consumer the best. Um, and just this idea of having a veggie based snack that was lower in calories and truly delicious and crispy and light and crunchy um, and full flavored, that's really, you know, what resonated the most. And so it just made sense for us to to talk about it, you know, as a, as a veggie chip. So Yeah, there is one ingredient that I would say that consumers do look for uh, specifically and that's protein um, and you have a protein or you have an anchor for your new protein platform obviously that's the chickpea snacks um, I think protein though even though it's been having a pretty serious moment it's still kind of confusing for a lot of consumers as to what the best kind of protein is or um, you know is this protein enough for me if I'm ha taking a handful of chickpeas for example roasted chickpeas um, do, in your research, have you found that consumers are a little confused or, you know, they don't care as much where the protein comes from? They just want it. I mean, how does how have you been able to identify the real need that modern consumers have for protein? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, they're also there. Yes, there are people who are really focused on I need to hit this protein goal mm -hmm. in my day. Um, and there is a growing number of consumers that are thinking like that because as you said, if you just look at the Google Trends charts for protein right now, they're just through the roof and they're continuing. It's not it's not a short-term trend, right? And so, um, but what we've learned is that when people look at Bienna and our chickpea snacks platform, again, it's kind of a similar learning to what I said about the veggie chips, which is they want something that's generally healthier they know that this has protein in it. They know it has fiber. Um, and when they, a lot of times consumers are also responding based on what makes them feel full, right? And so they may not articulate that fully, but they know it's like all the marketing and the branding in the world can help get a brand their first trial with a consumer. But once a consumer has tried this food product, their personal experience with the food is going to reign supreme, right? Mm -hmm. Over over any other thing that they hear about the product. And so it's like, yeah, I'm trying this because I see this great protein content. But then once you actually eat it, um, you know, you know how you feel when you're eating this food. And especially, I bring that up, especially for protein oriented foods, because you talked about how protein can be confusing, right? But there is this idea that when I'm eating protein, it's going to fill me up. I yeah. want something that's more solid that's going to fill me up. And so I think that's what our snacks really deliver on. And that's what people come back for that they're not getting from other snacking formats. You know, they're not feeling that hunger satiation that they're getting from our snacks. So I think it's it's a combination of the claims combined with the with the actual eating experience of the food that people are looking for. When you're getting most uh, or the, the best response um, from consumers about your roasted chickpeas, what tops the list? Is it taste? Is it the protein? Is it sort of the texture and taste? I think it's a combination of the taste combined with the protein, right? And so that's that's really what, um, and we've had this very intentional strategy from the beginning of going after mainstream snacking flavors. Um, you know, there's a reason why we have a ranch and a honey roasted and, you know, a sea salt. It's mm -hmm. because um, these are familiar flavors that it, it, that people feel good about. It makes them feel comfortable about eating something that maybe they haven't tried before. And it helps them bridge the gap. So and and, you know, we'll we will continue, um, you know, that strategy. I think the most amazing thing um, about the period that we're in now. And as I said, like we've been working on this strategy to build this long-term sustainable brand um, and that has these you know, attributes around growth opportunities, margins, and mission-driven business um, and mission-driven products. Um, the most amazing thing about the time period we're in now is that um, we have growth opportunities across both of our product lines, right? And so um, one of the things I tell founders when they talk about decisions that they're trying to make about their product lines or are they positioned well is I really encourage people to think about what are the long-term trends that you're positioned against, right? I mean, the whole reason Bienna is here and why we're 
still growing and thriving um, is because of a decision that I made, you know, over 10 years ago when I started this brand, which was at the time I had didn't have the advantage of Google Trends. Mm -hmm. um, but I was really betting on two trends. You know, one was a trend around protein and the second was a trend around chickpeas. And if you look at the Google Trends charts for those two trends today, you know, over the long term, those have just gone up and up and up and up, mm -hmm. you know, almost every single year. And they're at their highest peaks and continuing to go up. Um, and so if you can position yourself against those kinds of trends, um, that's kind of the underlying foundation of what's going to drive that long-term success for you. So that's that's kind of the exciting part about what we're doing now is that we've got these two platforms and they're really both growing across multiple channels. And then we have this kind of category leading position um, within protein snacking that we can really, um, you know, leverage and, and try to, you know, as we build out other products. The foundation of the brand um, as a better for you snacking platform that had an anchor of protein uh, embedded in that platform was intelligent and smart and forward thinking for sure. Um, I think there are other entrepreneurs out there that are listening to that and they're listening to this and saying, oh, well, you know, my brand is also rooted and founded and um, grounded in better for you snacking and um, and great taste. But it takes time to get off the ground. It takes time to get to a point where you can really scale. And that survival mode, I think, is what I'm going to describe it as. That survival mode of the first you know, one to three years can be really, really tough. Um, a lot of brands, in fact, most brands don't make it. Um, you know, when you were at the outset and thinking about how am I going to get this brand? How am I going to get Vienna at least to a point where I can reasonably say we have an opportunity to scale, you know, what does that survival mode look like? And, and how do you get to a point where you're comfortable with saying, okay, we're ready to take the next step? Yeah. I think the, the biggest thing that determines long-term success, if you really just want to look at the financial aspects of um, the CPG world and CPG businesses, and, and I'm going there because when you talk about survival, ultimately you need a strong financial foundation. You know, what creates a finan a strong like financial base for any CPG brand? It's a combination of two things, really. There's a lot, right? You could there's a lot we could talk about, but it really all boils down to two things. One is your velocities and the second piece is your margins. And so you really, your entire job, when you're going from zero to one, you people talk about that zero to one phase, which is the hardest phase, mm -hmm. um, because you're trying to get to product market fit. Um, so that's what I would ask founders or tell founders to think about, is to think about those two things. And, and if you can solve for those two things, everything else will fall in line, right? Because if you think about what does it take to, great, to get to great velocities, you need both that differentiated product and you need the right pricing and you need the right branding, right? And so um, so you're not gonna get um, you're not gonna get those two things until you you figure out some of the the product side of things. And so that's one thing. so I would I would talk about building that strong kind of finance financial foundation. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you could just say it's just the business foundation. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, one of the unique challenges of consumer products is that you're dealing with physical inventory. And that is what really um, creates a problem for earlier stage businesses, right? That don't have, maybe their um, their pro internal processes are, are just being built, right? And so they don't have the discipline or, um, the history to be able to forecast how much to produce so that you're not mm -hmm. underproducing and overproducing and, and all of those challenges. And so I think that one of the advantages that other industries like the tech space have is that they're not dealing with physical products. And so if you learn that something is not working in the market, 
you can rapidly just change, you know, your product features or mm -hmm. whatever it is you're working on. And so I've, cr I've created this methodology that we've, we're following at Vienna now, and I call it the build to win methodology. And it's this idea, it takes this idea from the tech industry, which is, let's just, I'm just going to summarize it as sell, design, build, which is you sell first mm -hmm. and you confirm that you can sell and then you design and build. And in our industry, because we're dealing with physical products, it's like we've got to build first right. and then see if it sells. Mm -hmm. So that process and how we have to do things because we're dealing with physical goods is a huge challenge for the, the smallest and youngest brands um, because inevitably, if you're innovating, you're doing something that isn't known fully in the market. And no matter how much you try to um, take your best guess at what you think is going to work, you just don't know till you know. You have to kind of put something in the market to know if this is going to work or not. Mm -hmm. And then now you've already invested all this money into inventory and suddenly you learn this flavor is not working or this claim you thought was going to be amazing is actually not as powerful as you thought or this naming or whatever it might be. And so... The idea behind this methodology that I created is the build to win methodology is take that idea that comes from the tech space, which is sell, design, and build, and implement it within CPG. How do you do that, right? And so, um, and there's kind of, you know, there's four or five pillars within, you know, under underlying that methodology. So, but it's really about testing and learning in small ways in the market before you make big commitments to do a launch. And um, so that involves, you know, creating something, testing it with consumers, putting it into both retail and online, and really getting that omni-channel feedback on, on whether something is really gonna work and getting the velocities you want, and doing all of that before you make any large commitments around launches. Is the velocities aspect the most important part of that feedback those insights yeah the velocities ultimately yes and um as well as the margins so okay. yeah so it's not necessarily about oh a consumer emails you or you do a survey and, and finds out oh yeah i like this but you could change this or this or that if they buy it you probably know it's going to work yeah. i mean if, if yeah. enough people buy it. right right yeah. and then can you rapidly iterate on the packaging also you know so if i if i look back at our veggie crisps line um, you know, we've actually changed packaging on that product line maybe four times mm -hmm. already. Um, and if you just looked at the front of the bag, you might not realize it, but we have made like some really significant changes to that packaging within a matter of two years. And so you just have to be bold in terms of you can't get stuck on what you think is best. You have to really focus on um, solving the problem for the consumer and and there, there's this great book uh that i read um last year i think it's like fall in love with the problem not your product or some, something like that mm -hmm. um and so this whole build to win methodology that's really what it's about which is rapidly iterating you know how do you create a test and learn infrastructure within a consumer products business that allows you to rapidly iterate um, and solve the problem for the consumer in the best way possible rather than getting stuck on your first execution or your second execution of what this product is. All such great advice and so many. I love, um, you know, your approach to, um, you know, thinking about the problem and solving a problem and creating a solution that really fits a consumer's need and many consumers' needs. Uh, it's really hard to do that if you don't have money to do those things. Um, and obviously the number one question that I get from entrepreneurs is, do you know any investors? Is, do you know any people that are willing to help me fund my business? And yeah, there are people out there, but it's it's tough. Um, and then even if you do get money, you're going to need more money. Um, you guys are in a good place. You've raised money. You you have you know plenty of cash flow at this point, but... You know, early on, what was you talked about the importance of you know financials? Um, how do you make sure you have enough money on hand to be able to not only survive but think about that future for your brand? 
you want to raise money at a time when it's going to be the best time for you to raise money for your business, mm -hmm. right? And so a lot of times that's about showcasing that you've reached certain milestones, um, whether it's, you know, ideally actually both in terms of the growth of your business as well as and traction, showing that traction, but then also showing that you have kind of this financial um, infrastructure, you know, that that will lead to a long term business. Um, so I think, you know, the, the big thing for entrepreneurs to think about in CPG in particular is how do I get myself to a place where I can show some of that early traction, um, as well as the financial acumen in the business, because that's, what's going to allow you to raise money under ideal conditions. Mm -hmm. Um, and until then I would try to beg and borrow money from friends and family, um, you know, from friendly investors that would allow you to get to that stage. It's kind of hard sometimes when you have an investor meeting or talking to an investor and they're like, what's this $50,000 chargeback from this distributor? Right. <laughs> and trying to explain the nuance. That, well, that's a, I, I call it a nuance. The challenge is whatever you want to call it, the, the awful part of the business that no one tells you about. Um, you know, those are parts of the you know, food and beverage industry that I think a lot of people are surprised by is the, the hidden costs or the, um, the the things that don't necessarily show up on a balance sheet or you wouldn't expect them to. Uh, how do you mitigate those costs? Um, you know, again, for people who are relatively new and signing on with big distributors, if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, what's your advice there? Yeah, it's actually uh, interesting because last night I was at an event and uh, – saw a founder that I've known uh, over the last couple of years, and she was asking me that same exact question. She's at a crossroads where she has a distribution opportunity and she has to select a distributor. Um, and so she's getting this kind of opposing advice. Um, and I think um, really when you're when you're working with large distributors, you are playing with fire <laughs> in a way because of exactly what you said, which is, um, one of the challenging things about CPG is that um, chargebacks and deductions come to you after the fact, right? And the people that are um, are putting these deductions in place have access to your money, um, and so that and that's kind of how the system works, right? And so you just need. Um, well, let me just talk first about the distributors. I would select a distributor where you can access people. Right, and so where you can pick up the phone and you can reach out to somebody if there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it's very simple advice, but that's really, really true. Um, and I wouldn't worry about margins in the sense that, you know, some distributors will offer, will take lower margins than others in terms of, you know, the markup that goes on top of your brand. But you need to build your pricing in a way that it doesn't tie you to a specific distributor, right? There needs to be enough margin in there for both a distributor and a retail partner to be able to take the margins that they need to get the product to shelf. I wouldn't, if you set up your pricing in a way that it ties you to a specific distributor, that's not gonna be a sustainable way to do your pricing. Mm -hmm. So first of all, take those shackles off yourself, develop a a good pricing structure that gives you the freedom to work with whatever distributor is right for you know that particular distribution opportunity. And select, if you're starting out, select a distributor partner that has people that you can access on the other side where you can build a relationship and they're gonna help you, you know, really be in the foxhole with you solving problems. Um, because, and those are typical, typically regional distributors from one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And and Vienna started the same way. You know, I chose a, a regional distributor when when we got started, and um, that was absolutely the right thing to do for the brand. Yeah, it's always. Uh, <laughs> I've heard many stories like this, but I remember the mo the one. Um, this is in, in beverage. Uh, the founder was expecting to get. I think a fifty thousand dollar check from one of his distributors, or get paid by one of his distributors, and I think he got an eight dollar bill. <laughs> oh my gosh, those yeah. are those are scary moments. Yes. Th th that can be a scary moment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyway, it's uh, you know, this business is tough. I mean, everyone who has ever 
created a brand, I think a couple of years in, they realize um, just how difficult it is. But I think the rewards are not endless, but the rewards are very valuable um, in that you are your own boss in a lot of ways. I mean, I think, you know, certainly your investors, you have to answer to them and you have to answer to your own employees, but you're still your own boss. Um, and if you're doing something right, if you're feeding people good food, that's definitely something you can hang your hat on, knowing that you are adding to uh, a solution or, or helping uh, Americans or whomever eat better than they had been prior. Uh, I think that's a great thing. Uh, I think you're doing that with Bienna. And um, I'm so happy that we had this opportunity to chat, Porby. Thank you so much for coming out to BevNet HQ here. And uh, I think we'll probably have to do this again uh, in at least you know, a couple of years. years. Yeah, maybe another five <laughs> years. Yeah, the last time we had you on was 2017. But um, I don't think it's going to be that much longer before uh, I ask you for another sit down. Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. And um, this was a really great conversation. I agree. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks.